the different types of validity with regard to Stansbury and Monroe. And we're doing this in preparation for writing our primary draft or critique paper. Okay. Um, I will give you the same advice I gave my other section, which is that the place to start with this paper is thinking about the different types of validity. So you want to think about how the researchers did with regard to the construct validity. How did they do with regard to the statistical validity? How did they do with regard to the internal validity? How did they do with regard to the external validity? And you want to come up with an opinion of how they did. And you want to be able to back up that opinion with evidence from the paper. So you're basically going to have probably four short paragraphs, maybe fewer if you decide to blend some together because you think you can connect the ideas. But you're going to basically talk, say, you're going to give your initial assessment of the quality of the construct validity of the study, and then you're going to back it up with some evidence from the paper. And then you're going to have another paragraph where you assess the statistical validity of the study. You make some statement about how good you think the statistical validity of the study was. Then you're going to back it up with some evidence from the paper. And you're going to have another paragraph that where you provide some topic sentence where you assess the internal validity of the study. And you're going to back it up with some evidence from the paper. So you're going to do that. And you only have two pages total, right? So we're not talking page-long arguments about each type of validity. We're talking about a third of a page type double space. So you need to make your claim about the quality of the study with regard to the particular type of validity you're talking about. Then you need to pick an example or specific evidence from the study to back it up. And then you need to move on. You're writing a persuasive essay, but a persuasive essay written in an objective scientific tone. That means you're going to try and make a case based on evidence you can deliver. Stuff, you're basically going to use the author's own paper to make your case. The facts they presented, you're going to use them to make a case. You're not going to say, the construct validity in this study was terrible because the researchers were clearly incompetent. Okay. Number one, not objective. <laughs> right? They're not incompetent. These aren't bad people. They're not incompetent researchers. Now, there may be times where they made decisions that you think affected, negatively affected a certain type of validity. That's a totally different thing than saying they're incompetent or don't know what they're doing or did made a horrible mistake. Those are not objective assessments. You can say that a particular choice they made had a negative impact on a particular type of validity. Or a particular choice they made had a positive impact on a certain type of validity. But we're not judging the researchers at, in terms of their quality as human beings. We're assessing choices that they made with regard to the design and implementation of their study. Now, sometimes people make choices because those are the only choices they have to make. Right? I'm sure we've all been in that position before, where you make a choice, you know it's not the best choice ever, but that's the choice you've got. Right? That's what you can do given the limitations that you're presented with. It doesn't make it a bad choice, but it also doesn't mean that it doesn't have negative consequences. Right? So for example, there's some debate about the extent to which students were randomly assigned to the different conditions of instruction. Right? Chances are they weren't. They don't say, but under the circumstances, it's 
extremely unlikely. And we'll talk about why. Now, you would think, but why did they just randomize students? Well, because under the circumstances, doing so could be potentially unethical. So sometimes you have to make the decision that makes your study slightly less valid in some dimension because it's unethical to do what would make it more valid in some dimension. You know, I'd love, to, as a psycholinguist, I'd love to do a study where I could take babies and isolate them from all human speech for years just to see if they would develop language. But for some reason, people have issues with that. <laughs> Because it would just be unethical to do that study. That's why it's called the forbidden experiment, right? To raise a child in total isolation from language to see if they develop language on their own. Um, so there's just some things we can't do, even though we might understand in research terms why it might be desirable to do so. As human beings, we know we can't. Okay? Or as educators, in this case. They knew they couldn't make some choices. So they made the best choices they could. Once you have kind of come up with your assessment for construct validity and statistical validity and internal validity and external validity. You can do those in any order you want. Those are just the order that they show up on the form and in the book and stuff. Then you have some general sense overall of how well you think they did. Now you're in a position to think about the overall thesis of your paper. Because your, your paper has to have a thesis statement. It has to have an introduction where you tell me a little bit about the study and then you make some specific claim, some thesis statement about the how well the researchers in this study address different types of validity that are important to experimental design. And you can't know what that thesis statement's gonna be whether you're going to say, you know, they did an, a, a, an extremely good job of addressing all types of validity, or they did a, an excellent job at addressing this kind of validity, but were weak in their addressing of these other types of validity, or whatever. I don't know. Depends on what you think the answer is. But you can't know what that's going to be until you've written other paragraphs. So it's, it's a weird process, because when I read the paper, I'm going to read it from the beginning to the end, and it needs to flow like that. But to make that work, what you want to do is write the middle first, where you're making the argument, and then design your introduction and conclusion to fit around that belly of the paper. So what you choose to tell me about the experiment that the researchers did, what you choose to focus on, what details you choose to provide me, that, that needs to be connected to one of two things. It needs to be connected to one of the types of validity you're going to talk about, or it needs to be connected to just what any person would need to know to have a basic understanding of what the researchers did. Because keep in mind, the author, or excuse me, the reader of your paper supposedly has not read the article. So you have to tell me enough about the study that I have a basic idea of what they did, and I can appreciate the argument you're making about the different types of validity. So you're going to have an introduction with a thesis statement, your different paragraphs about the different types of validity, and then a conclusion statement. That's probably a rephrasing of the thesis statement, but with some additional detail, because now I've read the whole paper and I have some idea of what points you were trying to make. So while your thesis statement might have been more general, your conclusion statement is more specific. Because now I have data from the points you raised. Now you've got two pages. Two. Now you know how hard it was to write about this paper in one page. Some people struggle to get a whole page. Most people struggle to have just one page. Now you're going to have to say even less. And some of what you tell me about the experiment in the paper is going to be integrated into your discussion of validity. Right? You might not lead with it. Because it might be, you just don't have space to repeat points. You don't have time to repeat things. Every sentence needs to be information I need, not information I already have. Okay. So let's talk today about the different types of validity and about some of the issues that could be relevant to each type of validity. Because you're going to have to choose what evidence you want to bring to bear for your assessment. 
If you're going to say, if you're going to rate in your mind each type of validity for this study, think 10 is, this is a fantastic example of an experiment with regard to this kind of validity. And one is, this is a total failure with regard to this kind of validity. You're going to have to think, for each type of validity, where would I put this study? Is it a 2, a 3, a 4, is it a 7, an 8, a 9, is it a 5? And don't just go with, it all buys all the way down. Because that, if you go with, you know, they get kind of an okay job, then you're going to have to give me, like, you're going to have to back that up, right? It's going to have to be, well, they did this well, but they did this really bad, right? I mean, your, your argument is going to have to back up your assessment of each type of validity, right? The evidence you provide is going to have to match. So if you think they did a really poor job addressing a particular type of validity, then your evidence is going to have to support a really poor job, right? It can't just be one bad thing, but, you know, there's just kind of this, there's a, a kind of catastrophic... <laughs> Uh, loss of this type of validity for these different reasons. Right? Or we can't even assess this study for this kind of validity because of all these problems or something like that. So construct validity, what is that? What's construct validity? How well the variables were measured and manipulated. Right, how well the variables were measured and manipulated. Okay, so how well did the researchers really tap into the things they said they were tapping into? How well did the independent variables define the groups they were supposed to define? How well did the dependent variable pick up on the psychological phenomenon, the behavior that the researchers wanted to be quantifying? So the dependent variable for the main experiment was what? You guys just wrote a paper on this and turned it in today. What was the dependent variable? <laughs> Content knowledge measured how? Hmm? Yeah, pre test and post test, but specifically measured how? Pre test, post test is when they measured it relative to the instruction. <laughs> Scores, okay? Scores on what? 14 questions. 14 questions of what type? 14 multiple choice questions from where? Where'd the questions come from? The test bank associated with the textbook that they use in the class. Okay. So this textbook, okay, so students were supposed to have read the material from this textbook for the purpose of preparing for the lecture. Now, of course, you know and I know that just because the professor has assigned students to read material prior to a particular lecture doesn't mean it actually happens. But technically, all of the students had the opportunity and the instruction to read that chapter, and that that chapter was foundational to the lecture that was content relevant. Of course, the students in the no content or the no relevant content condition didn't do that because they were instructed to do that. Why would you read a chapter on factorial design prior to a lecture on t-test? You wouldn't. But the test itself was made up of questions that were intentionally designed to connect with material all the students had access to. These are the publisher provided questions for this chapter that was related to the topic. Does that seem like a reasonable thing to use to test their knowledge? Seems okay. Seems okay, right? I mean, how many faculty have you ever had that use questions from a test bank? Lots of them. This is a common practice. It's well accepted. The questions were not just arbitrarily generated, but specifically connected to the textbook the students were using, so chances are the wording was similar to wording they were familiar with. The 
content is going to match up with what they had been reading. So in terms of how good this was as a measure of their knowledge of factorial design and analysis, okay. Seems like a pretty reasonable choice. Thumbs up. It's not like they had students generate questions or that they, you know, each each faculty member got to generate their own questions, right? Everybody used the same question. They were all questions from the test bank. The test bank was associated with the textbook. This is all very careful. Trying to be consistent, trying to make sure that the students have the best opportunity to get a good score if they understand the content. Now, if we think about that test, Pre-test, post-test, right? So they used the same questions before and after. Now, what, what would we like to think the score on the test represents? What's it supposed to tap into? What's it supposed to measure? Your knowledge of factorial designs. Okay. Now, at pre-test, I can see that that would be pretty. You can be pretty confident that it would reflect your knowledge of factorial designs. But at post-test. It could reflect that and something else. What's the something else? They already know the questions or they might have forgot the technical word for it, but they'd already seen them before. So right. So there's a, there could there's a potential for a practice yeah. effect. Practice, here, right? There's a potential for a practice effect here. They've already seen the questions, so it's possible that students could do better on the test just because they've seen the questions before. And as a result, students could have the opportunity to you know, maybe go look up answers or try to figure it out. Or if they're getting content related to the test, they might just pay attention specifically to content that's related to those test questions and not really understand factorial design, but just like focus in on the things that would help them answer those questions better, having seen those questions before and thus knowing that the Instructor thinks that those questions are important or cover important content. Yeah. Well, some of that would be covered with having the condition that just took the test twice, right? Yes. This is why they had the no treatment control condition. Because the, the group of students in the no treatment control condition who got a lecture on t-tests and then engaged in some passive learning activity about t-tests. Those students saw the questions, talked about something that had nothing to do with the questions, and then saw the same <coughs> questions again. So if those students did significantly better the second time around, there would be evidence for a practice effect, and evidence that there's a problem with the measure. Did they do better? No. No. Um, they did the same, right? No difference. Did it say they knew that they were going to take the same test twice? I can't remember that. Or probably not. They okay. probably didn't tell them they were given the same questions. But if I said to you, "Okay, class, we're getting ready to study factorial designs. Here's a test to see how much you already know. Yeah. Give you 15 questions, and then we proceed to do two lectures about factorial designs. Isn't it possible that the things the questions were about would be things you go, "Oh, that we had a question about that on that test." That's probably important. Does that make sense? You might pay more attention. Now, which group in this study allowed them to test whether or not that was a problem? That students could potentially focus on material from the pretest and use it to do better? Yes, the standard treatment control. Now, can I make, I, I have to, to say this out loud. I have an issue with their description of their different categories. And they talk about the no content group, the lecture only group, and the video game group. And first of all, the no content group didn't have no content. They had content. No, it just wasn't content. relevant content. Okay. 
It's not that they just sat there for two hours and, you know, picked their noses or something, watched cartoons. It wasn't a pinky in the brain view fest. It was just, they were, it's not that they had no content, it's that they had, their, the lecture that they experienced had no content relative to the dependent variable. And that's important, we'll get to that in a minute. The lecture only group didn't have only a lecture. It's misleading, this label that they use. Because what happened in the standard treatment control group is that they experienced a lecture, the standard lecture about factorial design and some analysis. And then they engaged in the traditional activity, passive learning activity of talking about examples, talking about fake data, looking at some graphs. Okay, it's not that they had only a lecture. It's that they had a lecture and a passive learning activity that's that standard, right? You do that all the time, right? That's the standard treatment. That's typically what we do. The experimental group had the same kind of lecture, same kind of standard lecture on vectorial design, whatever that means, they don't say. But they had that lecture, and then they engaged in an interactive, active learning activity about vectorial design that required that the students apply the knowledge, get up and move, gather data, do analysis, Right? It wasn't just, let's talk about somebody else's data, let's look at somebody else's graphs, let's see if we can see patterns. It was, let's now let's take it and now let's design an experiment and see how it works. So, that's why I like talking about these levels as the experimental group, the standard treatment control, and the no treatment control. Because those terms, it's that, I think those terms more accurately describe what happened here. But that no treatment control group where they listened to, they got a lecture and did an activity too, it just had nothing to do with the dependent variable. That's why they had no treatment, because they had no treatment relevant to the dependent variable. So that group was intended, that group was developed, was used because they needed to show to what extent people could do better on the post-test just because they'd seen the questions before. And how they do? No better. No results. Excellent. That's good for them. The standard treatment control group differed from the no treatment control group in that the lecture and focus of their passive learning activity was relevant to the dependent variable. Okay? They talked about factorial design and examples related to factorial design and data from factorial design experiments other people did. So it differed from the no treatment control in simply one dimension, which was the content of the lecture and activity or the topic of the lecture and the activity. So if, we, now we back up again. If it was possible to do better on the post-test by taking the pretest and then being exposed to stuff that's relevant and picking out stuff from that exposure that was familiar to you because you'd seen questions on the pretest, what should have happened at the post-test for the standard treatment control? They should have done, done better. Right? Because they had a chance to recognize stuff from the pretest and use that knowledge to do better on the post-test. Right? Did they do better? Were they significantly better from pretest to post-test? No. They were not. They were marginally better. It wasn't significant, but it was close. Right? So it could be that with a larger sample, they might have actually been significantly better from pretest to post-test. But in fact, they weren't. Okay. So this was a null finding, effectively. There was a trend in the direction that they might like to have seen in terms of learning. I mean, as a professor, do you know how it breaks my heart to see that students who sat through a lecture and then talked about data didn't improve from pre-test to post-test? That's scary. Okay. 
mean, it suggests that that passive learning thing isn't necessarily the way to go. Right? Doing something with the knowledge helps you learn more than just talking about what other people did with the knowledge. But the fact that that group, that standard treatment control group, didn't do better on the post-test suggests that the researchers don't have to worry about any improvement they see as coming from that, oh, I saw the questions before, I picked out things, and that's why I did better. That's good, because it means if they observe any significant improvement at post-test, they can attribute it to whatever was different about that group compared to the other groups. So if, for example, the experimental group does significantly better on the post-test than the other groups, or if they have, if they significantly improve from pre-test to post-test, they can say, we know it's not just because they saw the questions before, we know it's not because they had a chance to hear some stuff about factorial designs and just focused on the data related to those questions, we know it has to do with whatever was different about the experimental condition that didn't occur in the other levels of that independent variable. And they found both of those results, right? Both of the predicted results they observed. So they can attribute it to the one thing that's different about the experimental group, which is the nature of the application activity. In this case, playing Dance Dance Revolution. Designing an experiment, using Dance Dance Revolution, and gathering data and trying to interpret the results. So that active learning activity, that's the only thing that differed from the standard human control. And I mean, that's the argument, right? So we can say this active learning activity of engaging in the material Doing something like playing Dance Dance Revolution and gathering data that way helps students learn. And we think it's because they were more interested in what we were doing. It's more fun to play Dance Dance Revolution than talk about other people's data. Right? So, we were right. Now, from the perspective of thinking that each level of the IV was pretty cleanly distinguished from the others, and by only one thing. Nice job designing that IV, right? Good job. Because we can see what single thing was different between the different levels of the IV that we can attribute any significant findings to. And we got the finding exactly where we wanted it, if we're standing for in a row. But here's where internal validity stuff starts to come. Because what's internal validity? Well, that's, that's construct validity. Wow. So, what's internal validity all about? Oh, um, no confounding variables. No confounding variables, right? No third variables. No alternative explanations for the pattern of results. And the only way that you can be confident that there are no alternative explanations for the results is if you have done a good job eliminating third variable explanations for your finding. You've made the groups, it's independent groups for right, between subjects variable, so you've made the groups as similar as possible in every way prior to the study starting, right? And we typically do that with random assignment, right? We randomly assign subjects from the pool of students who are going to participate to the different conditions to distribute individual differences as evenly as possible across the conditions to minimize the likelihood that the groups were different in some other way than which condition they were in. How well did the researchers in this study do that? Let's think about the ways. Let's make a list of how many ways the students in the different conditions 
vary from each other aside from their instructional condition. We're just going to put the instructional condition aside. Let's think about how they were different. First of all, instructor. Did they have the same instructor in all no. three conditions? No. No. What'd they do instead? Five different sections. How many different instructors? Four. Four different instructors, five different sections, divided up into three different conditions. Something doesn't match. I'm using too many fingers. Okay? So, different sections, different instructors. Okay? And the pattern of sections and instructors was different. Okay. So in the experimental group, how many instructors did they have? One instructor, how many sections? Two. Two. Okay. So the person who was teaching for the experimental condition is somebody that was teaching multiple sections of the same course in the same semester. Okay. And both of them were participating in the study. All right, so we have two sections. But one instructor. All right, now what about the standard treatment control group? How many sections? Two. Two. Great. How many instructors? Oh, gosh. Different again. So nice that it's two sections. Okay. But now you've got two different instructors. Yes? Isn't it also problematic that they only uh, provide the amount of students in those sections. The number, actually. The need, yeah, for both the group together. They don't even separate it by the two sections. That's true. They So in the case of the experimental condition and the standard treatment control, they report the numbers for the two sections blended together. So you don't know if one section was mostly men, the other was mostly women, or what. You don't know. All you know is that collectively, those two groups had this many men and this many women. True. So that's detail we don't know. So we don't know the extent to which those sections might have been different from one another. Yeah. I'll answer it. Okay. You have to go. No, I have to I was going to say, does it, I can't remember, does it mention how many students were in each class approximately, but that kind of just answers the question. Kind of. You don't know. But, but they did, it does seem, try to make an effort. They did this weird thing, right, where they had one instructor, two sections, two instructors, two sections, right? But if you look at the, purport, the numbers for those two conditions and the proportion of women and men, they look really similar, right? So my guess, I don't know whether this is right or not, they didn't say it, but this is my guess as a researcher is that what they did was try to come up with combinations of sections that would give them about the same numbers of students and about the same numbers of women and men. So they were trying to make the two groups as similar as they could in terms of how many students were in each condition and how many women and how many men. So they were trying to make them more similar. But they weren't doing this through some process of randomization or matching. They were doing this saying, okay, so we got all these sections, we got these professors who said they'd be willing to do this experiment, and what combination will give us sections, that, groups that look kind of the same? So this is more like, we're gonna, okay, if we put these two together, that'll work. If we put these two together, that'll work. And then they had the no treatment control. How many sections? One. How many teachers? One. Okay. So now we have only one section. And the numbers are a bit smaller. I think it has about two-thirds of the students that were in the other conditions. So the numbers are smaller. The group is smaller in number. Only one instructor this time. So the different groups did not vary only in what instructional treatment they received. They varied in terms of who their instructor was,
and they vary potentially in other ways that could be connected to which section they were in in the first place. What kind of things influenced your choice about choosing this section of this class, for example? Why'd you pick this class, this one? Huh? How many students are in the class? So, how many students were in it when you got a chance to register, right? You picked the one that had space, right? What other things helped you decide to pick this class? Please use RateMyProfessor.com. Okay, so if you read, you read, you're like, that professor sounds cool. Buy penguins. I want to get, you know. Others in general. Huh? So just the opinions of others in general, like, which you may have heard about professor. Right, so other people might have said, that professor's really cool. I really, your friend took that professor and said, oh, you would totally love this person. Go take the class with that person. Okay, what other things? Time slot. Time slot! I do not want to get up at 9.30. Nope. <laughs> right? I was at my 9.30 class. I said, so how many of you guys signed up for this class? Because the 11 o'clock class was full. No. All of them? <laughs> not all of them, but some. <laughs> some of them were like, so early, it's 9.30. <laughs> oh gosh, I've been up for like six hours already. All right, so time slot's a factor. Professor's reputation is a factor. Huh? Location. Location is a factor. You're like, I hate taking classes in Adderall. I'm going to take a class in Adderall. I'm going to wait until I get a class in classroom stuff because I hate hiking up to Adderall. Could also be the days the class meets, right? People pick classes because some people are like, I need to be Monday, Wednesday because I work Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Or I need it to be Tuesday, Thursday. I do all my classes Tuesday, Thursday because I work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or whatever. So there are all kinds of reasons why students take a particular class. They may have had the professor before, too, and they want to take another class of the professor that they know they like. So there's lots of reasons why students take a class. And they, students are paying for the class, right? Or somebody is. Scholarships are paying for it, parents are paying for it, students are paying for it, somebody's paying for it, right? Federal loan, something, okay? Somebody's paying for that class, and the outcome is a grade in addition to learning, you know, that learning thing. But the outcome is a grade that affects their GPA, which could influence their ability to keep a scholarship or get a scholarship, could influence their ability to get into grad school, not get into grad school, or get a job, not get a job, right? So the stakes are high. There's a cost associated with it, there's time commitment, this is a hard class, it's usually a required class, you're at Georgia State, you have to pass this class in two tries or you're out of the major. Right? No do-overs after that. You could be two classes away from graduation and you still have to change your major. There's some high stakes. Now, how would you feel as students if at the beginning of the semester, we threw all of you into the 35-30 lottery <laughs> and said, all right, you want to take 35-30. We have 12 sections. you got to sign to Professor A. You've got to sign to Professor B. And you're taking the class on this day at this time. And you're taking it on this day at this time. And you're taking it on this day at this time. Oh, you don't like class at 8 o'clock in the morning? Sorry, that's what you got randomly assigned to. <laughs> huh? Or <a> Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Oh, you're assigned to the 5 to 7 o'clock in the evening section. Yeah, they right and you work at a restaurant. Where, you know, we work evenings at a restaurant or a bar. You're like, I'm what? <laughs> and it means Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You're work taking class three days a week, Monday. Oh, and the lab is on Fridays from 7 to 9 p.m. They do that? <laughs> I'm just trying to make it as bad as possible. Okay. Regardless, I don't, what if you're like, but my religion says I can't even be out of my house after sundown. I can't use electricity after sundown. I, how am I supposed to go to lab on Friday night after sundown? What if you get a professor and you're like, oh my god, I heard about this professor. This professor is the worst. I could not teach her way out of a wet paper bag. Worst professor ever. My friend had her. Hey, hey. Or they just teach you what you hate. Wait, what? Not you. Not you. Okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> 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 well, you just can't understand them because they might not 
You might have a very strong accent that's difficult to understand. Okay, but how would you feel? And then your grade is dependent on all of these choices, right? I mean, maybe it just completely screws with your life, whatever, okay? So it's unethical to, for us to do that, right? Now, what would happen if we said, okay, let's do this really ethically. Let's just say, all right, so for this particular test, for this particular unit, you're going to take one class with this one person, okay? And then for unit number four, we're going to randomly assign all the students in 3532 to some professor, and we're all going to give the same lecture, and we're all going to do the same stuff, and we're just going to randomly assign, but, but the grade still counts. How would you feel about that? You have broken in one professor for three units. Right? You know how that person teaches, you know how that person tests. Getting randomly assigned to a new professor for just that one unit, that would suck. And it could affect your grade. And what if you're struggling already and you get assigned to somebody and you're like, oh, great. There goes my grade in this class. That wouldn't be good either. So there's automatically some selection effect with who gets into what section in the class. Right? People try to get into the section they think is going to be the best section for them. And chances are that people who are all in one section have some similar values, properties, and things like that. There are students who want the evening sections of a class because they work during the day and that's the only time they can go. There are people who want the sections early in the morning because they need to be done with school in the afternoon so they can go pick up their kids. There are people who work and people who don't work. And so you'll see in particular sections of a course, groupings of people who have similar properties. So they've got five sections of a class, but we don't know when they were taught, how many times per week. We don't know if they were early morning, late afternoon. We don't know if the students at the school often work or not. We don't know if the students were all taking full course loads or maybe part-time students. All of these things could affect differences in the students or who was taking one class at what time. So there is a distinct possibility that the students in the different groups vary in ways that students normally do across sections of a large course. And you know, when seniors are ready to take this class, you know, seniors get first dibs at registering, right? So seniors are always the first. If they haven't taken 3530, they're the first ones that get in, right? So which, which ones do the juniors, which sections do the juniors and sophomores get into? The 8 o'clock and Monday, Wednesday, Friday <laughs> classes, right? Or the, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 7 to 9 p.m. class or something like that, right? Those are the ones that's better. And they can't get in, if, if they can get in at all, right? Now, the students in this study, were, the groups were all roughly the same age, between 21.7 and 22, right? The groups were pretty close. We're all talking 22, that, we're talking traditional college senior, right? So these were all upperclassmen, so similar in age, right? Um, so they were similar in that regard. But there are a number of ways that these groups differ or could potentially differ because it's not clear that the researchers could ethically have randomly assigned them to the conditions. And even if they randomly assigned the professors to their teaching condition, that doesn't change when the class was taught or any other things that would induce selection effects in the different groups. Now let me ask you another question as a researcher. If you had four professors who had volunteered to help you with your study on teaching, and you had an experimental group. This is a kind of risky group, right? Are you going to randomly assign a professor to that risky group? Or what are you going to do? You're probably going to want the one, because do you think every professor who's good at teaching research methods would want to do Dance Dance Revolution with their class? Maybe not. So you've got to have somebody who believes in the activity, too, believes in the task, is ready to sell it to the students as a non-traditional way to learn about the topic, right? And you could have four professors who are all good at teaching research methods, but it doesn't mean they would all be good at doing that. In fact, I would bet, I could be wrong, I don't know, but I would bet that one of the authors on the paper was that professor. 
Because if you're going to design a study like this, it's because you want to do that with your class. So being really excited about it might change. Because if you're doing the fun condition, right? Well, I mean, part of it is about having it be fun for the students, right? And part of what makes it fun for the students is when the professor's having fun. If you think the professor is engaged with you and engaged with the activity and enjoying himself or herself or themselves, then you are more invested. Yeah? So just to clarify, these students signed up for these classes and then the sections were we don't know. This sounds like something that, I mean, we can assume that students register for the class, or if we assume that the students register for the class, like students register for every other class. They just picked a class that had the professor they wanted, the time slot they wanted, or had space, right? And then at some point during the semester, I mean, factorial design is not the first thing you start off with. This is half or two thirds of the way through the course. So chances are, they were already in the class, and then the researchers decided to do this experiment. And so they just picked this, they, the students were already in. Except for the one, for the video game condition, it's one professor with two sections, so they would have had to change either. So they would have had I'm to change two sections. sections. It could have just been something like different times. times. Different times, right. But they, just, uh, they don't specify if they, if they do it at the same time. They, we don't know if the other teachers are teaching at the same time as the person in the experimental group either. They could all be, all the classes could be at different times of day, in different days of the week. 3530 classes, you go look at the schedule, they're taught all day long, every day of the week. We teach 12 to 16 sections of this class every semester. Because every student has to take it. And the class has to stay so. All right, so there's lots of ways that these things, these groups were different. Well, potentially, they could be different. But, that being said, the researchers were really restricted in what they could ethically do. Because to use random assignment in this situation would be unfair to the students. And the students' grades are not less important than gathering data. Okay? Being fair to students. You don't throw a wrench like that in students' learning. So maybe it I mean, I think it, the internal validity of the study was clearly threatened, but it's not clear that the researchers could do anything about that. Yeah. But that's, and that's why it was a subject variable, right? Because it wasn't randomized. Okay. Because the students were chosen because of who their teacher was, because their teacher was somebody who had volunteered. Okay. Or, or because their two sections combined made the right number of students and they had the right proportion of men and women. They had that property. The pre -existing, it was the pre-existing property. They were in the class of the professor who said, you do it, or she'd do it. And who knows what else came along with that. Does that make sense? All right, so let's talk now about the statistical validity. This is a factorial design. So what's the statistic that the researchers care about the most? Factorial design, what do we always care about the most? The interaction. The interaction. That's what we're all about in factorial design. So take a look at the paper. Take a look at the interaction. Do we believe that the statistic that they generated for this interaction represents a real effect, or could it represent a type 1 or type 2 error? Did they get a statistically significant interaction? Yes, they did. Okay. So what we're worried about is that they could have a type 1 error here. This could actually be a false alarm. They could say they have a significant result for the interaction, but in fact, it's not a real effect. It's the result of something else besides what they did. And if they, somebody else does it at another school, another place, different people, it's not going to manifest again. It's a false alarm. So what can we look at to try and see how convinced we are that this effect is real? What about the statistic might convince us that this is not just an accident, but something that really matters, that having that active activity as part of the learning experience really makes a difference? The way they got their scores? I don't think that's where they're I'm looking for something specifically about the statistics they reported. Sample size. Sample size is important. 
Okay, their samples were huge. They were in their 20s, right? 16 to 20. Okay, what else matters that gives us a significant result besides sample size? The design. The design, the power. Take a look at the effect size. How big was the treatment effect for the interaction? 0.31. She says correcting herself because it's an N squared. <laughs> You're never going to forget that ever, are you, sir? No, ever. No. Okay. So, how, is that a small, medium, or large effect? 31% or 0.31. That's a big effect, right? That's a large effect. That suggests that this interaction was very powerful that the connection of time and instructional condition mattered a lot. And which condition popped out from all the others? What was our one of these things is not like the other? The right, the experimental condition in the post-test, right? That's the one that was different from all the rest. That's the one that popped out on the graph, right? High up in the corner. Because students in that condition were significantly better than students in the other instructional conditions at post-test, and they were significantly better than themselves at pre-test. Given that that is an effect size of 31%, or 0.31 using edit squared, that's pretty compelling. Because the sample sizes weren't that huge. All the samples were less than 30. That's typically the smallest we want to secure a normal distribution. So even though the samples weren't huge, we still got this big effect. That suggests that whatever they did really, really mattered. That combination of factors really, really mattered. Now, take a look at the main effects. What are the effect sizes for the main effects? What about for the main effect of instructional condition? 0.13, small, medium, or large effect? Medium, medium effect. <laughs> You're like, what was it? Oh my gosh, we're having to apply this now. It's hard. Medium. Okay, so it's a medium effect for instructional condition. What about for time? Pre-test, post-test, what's the effect size? 0 0.28. 0 0.28, small, medium, or large? Large. Okay, well that makes sense. Before you learn something has a significant <laughs> difference from after you learn something. So time had a large effect on how well people did on the dependent variable. And instructional condition had a medium-sized effect on how well they did. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind, these are main effects that are occurring in the presence of an interaction, so they could be amplified or minimized as a result of the interaction. But still, for the main outcomes of the ANOVA that they ran, the factorial ANOVA, they got, the smallest effect they got was a medium-sized effect. No small effects at all. So how does that make us feel about whether or not these, these effects are real and not type 1 error? What do we think? What's the evidence suggest? Should we believe their findings or are we suspicious? They seem pretty solid. That is a nice, balanced way to put it. They seem pretty solid. Given that the effect sizes range from a medium to large treatment effect, even in the face of relatively small samples, these findings seem statistically convincing. Yeah? Doesn't it, do you think that they were able to make their effects have a little bit bigger by telling all students that the pre-test wouldn't be graded. So it's almost like 
They interesting. Them. Interesting. They told them the pretest wasn't going to count for anything. Right. How do you respond if a teacher says, I'm going to give you a test, but it doesn't really count for anything? <laughs> You're like, I'm going to circle answers that make a happy face, you know, or something. You're like, you don't even care, right? So you're right. They might have, there, there's some concern that the instructions they gave could have made the scores at pretest unnaturally low. They didn't even clarify if they told the students in the no content condition that or not. They just said that they did for the other two conditions. So the ones in the no content could have not even known if it was going to be or not. Sure. So potential problem, right? That could, so that's a weakness in statistical terms. That they could have actually artificially inflated the differences for, that artificially inflated the differences by giving that particular instruction early on. You're right. Good catch. Okay. So what about external validity? Yeah. What extent can we replicate this in other settings with other subjects and different conditions? Now, if we want to go strict, let's use Dance Dance Revolution and Research Methods class replication. What problems might we face? Let's think about who the students were who participated in this study. How old were they? 21, 22 years old. Likely familiar with video games? Physical video games like playing on Wii or Xbox 360 or you know things like that. Probably some familiarity having that. Have more physical ability in general than maybe like an older student. Might have more physical ability than a, an older student, non-traditional student. If your grandma was taking research methods because she decided to go back and get her degree, you think she'd be all up there doing Lady Gaga <laughs> Dance Dance Revolution? It would be, <laughs> it would be fall, fall revolution, right? Fall, fall lawsuit is what it would be, right? Or there are probably like a cultural difference, like um, for students in another country that might not have that name. That's true. So students might have, it might be students from other, uh, or maybe just students who never had access to those kind of games, but they didn't have money. Yeah, that's right. Could be cultural differences where, yeah, that maybe dancing. Or what if you have physical limitations? Like if you're in a wheelchair, or you have some kind of other disability, like what if you're deaf or you're blind? That could impact your ability to play that game. Absolutely. So this particular activity seems to demand a lot, uh, it seems to require a particular group of students. Younger students who are at least familiar with some degree to playing video games and have the physical ability to engage in a game that requires full body action and who can see well and hear well, probably. So students with disabilities, now might also help that the songs that they use were like Lady Gaga and Sean Paul, right? But that's, they told me last time, reggae, right? Like the reggae kind of style. Well, I mean, I don't know that you have to do it with those two artists, right? You could let students pick which songs they wanted to do it with, right? And there's lots of songs that are available as options in that game. But does it have to be Dance Dance Revolution? Because Dance Dance Revolution might have limitations that other activities might not. What if you just thought about this as an active learning activity that required students to get up and do something with the knowledge to generate original data, design an experiment, participate in the study they designed. I mean, what if instead they played a game of Jeopardy, right, where all they had to do was hit a button, right? Or, you know, some other game that was more engaging. You could have teams and you could try to gather data on, you know, how fast people responded, how accurately they responded. I mean, there's other things you could do that would be interesting and fun that didn't necessarily involve being able to do. Yeah, right, because watch, to me, it's stumble, stumble revolution, right? It's not going to be skillful. Yeah. I don't know if this, this is right, but since the study was predominantly female mm -hmm. and the uh, game was Dance Dance Revolution, wouldn't that appeal more to females than it would to males in the study? I don't know. You guys like playing Dance Dance Revolution? 
but they're doing it with psych majors, and I'll tell you, psych majors are more often female than male. I mean, look around. This is a highly feminized major, <laughs> because psychology is about caring. <laughs> It's about, it's about taking care of others. It's about helping people. And that's what girls do. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, it's funny, because you think back, if you've got any history of psychology, you know psychology was historically a male-dominated field. But as it has come to focus on helping others with mental health issues, and helping others through developmental challenges, it has become feminized because it's viewed as a caring profession, and that's not for guys. So guys, yay you for caring. Revolutionary. You're still carrying the torch of caring for the guy team. Good job. Yeah? They, used, um, they said they used the intense revolution because it generates numerical scores, so they could use it for design and study. So wouldn't they have to use a game that almost required some kind of score output? Well, that's what I'm saying. But you, what if you had how fast people responded, like in a Jeopardy game, how fast they could hit the button, or how accurate they were, like whether they got answers right or wrong? Well, there's tons of games that even just sit there with a controller and there's range it. Games. So that generates some kind of score. Yeah. And you could, I mean, could you do Candy Crush? That generates a score. Yeah. Some kind of score. So, so all I'm saying is that if if you change what would meet the criteria, like they said, they needed a game that would generate a score, and that would be fun, and that would motivate students to participate, and that would be interesting, so that students would care about the activity and pay attention. Right? Not to their do baseball. Almost seems like it requires a competitive nature too. Yeah, but all you do is make teams. All right, this side of the room. Bonus points to whichever side wins. Now watch. Just watch. It'll be like, people are going to be like, throwing stuff over here, trying to make people lose. What? No. You can get people to be. Do you think it's really that hard to get college students to be competitive when it comes to a video game? Or some but other kind of game? I don't think it necessarily had to be competitive. But wasn't it just to generate numbers, not necessarily to win? Like, they played the game but to generate didn't. numbers for their study. But they did also try to make it so that it wouldn't be too, you know, daunting. And, like, they did, they turned off the applause feature. So if people sucked at it, it wouldn't go like, boom. <laughs> you know, trying to, trying to make people feel bad <laughs> playing the game, right? It seems like that automatically makes people engage because it's a competition. You're well, okay, so, so but you need something that's going to generate engagement among that group. But you might find that with the different age students or students from a different cultural community, that the competition isn't the thing that works. Maybe collaboration is what would encourage people to work hard. So you need to know your cultural community and choose an activity that is culturally appropriate for the group that you're working with. But nonetheless, if you were able to choose an active learning activity that was culturally appropriate for the physical and social abilities of your group, this, that would seem like a reasonable choice. Now, one thing we talked about last time is this particular group. We don't know much about them except they came from a mid-sized university. We don't know what university, although we can guess it's the university where the researchers work. Now I looked up that university, Towson University. It's a uh, large, it calls itself a large public university in Maryland. 65% white, 15% black. Now we said, hey, would that generalize to, say, a place like Georgia State, another large public university? Well, certainly not in terms of racial and ethnic makeup. But then here's my question. Does one's race, race and ethnicity have a direct impact on whether or not one would benefit from active learning in a classroom? So maybe, although the researchers didn't potentially didn't have a very racially and ethnically diverse population in their study, it's not clear that race or ethnicity is really relevant to this issue. So this is an important thing to think about when you're evaluating external validity. Every population is not going to look like every other population, right? Every sample is not going to look like every other sample. But the question is, are the differences that you see between the sample in the study and the sample maybe that you identify, or the population you identify with, are those differences differences that would be relevant under these circumstances? Do you think that 
a Latino student could not appreciate playing a video game in a class in a, differently than an African American student or a white student or an Asian student or, you know, whatever. Does it matter? It might influence what songs they pick to play. It might influence maybe whether they want to be competitive or not. But if you know the community you're working with, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Does that make sense? So I don't, I, I would prefer if you didn't kind of jump back to the, oh, it, was, it probably wasn't a racially and ethically diverse <coughs> population. But does it really matter? We really think that would matter in this case. Yeah? Well, so that's the thing, is that we're always playing this cost-benefit game where I want to have diversity because I want to make sure that I can represent a wide variety of people. I might not have access to a wide variety of people, so I'm going to use who I can get. And, But there are also cases where we don't think that certain types of diversity are necessarily relevant. Um, I would like to think that any student in a classroom could benefit from being engaged or excited about the material and that their race or ethnicity wouldn't make any difference. I don't think that white students benefit more from being excited about the material than black students. Do you? Why would they? Being excited about what you're doing is just a people thing, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the color of your skin. Now, what might excite you the, t the type of activity, or the music you might like, or whether you want to be physically competitive or not physically competitive, or those kind of things. That might vary, but that might as, have as much to do with age as race or ethnicity, right? Or you're, maybe you come from a very conservative background and you don't dance. You don't dance in public, for sure. I mean, maybe you live in footloose land. I don't know. Maybe it would make you really uncomfortable to do that. So again, it's knowing your community and what would engage and excite them. I would not recommend um, playing quarters as the activity. That would probably not be appropriate. <laughs> but, you know, it's a game that generates scores, but probably not a good choice. <laughs> Even though your students might think it's great. Some of them might not. So. so here's what you need to do now. You need to think about each one of those types of validity, construct validity, statistical validity, internal validity, external validity. We've talked about some of the issues. You want to kind of decide what your opinion is for each one of those. Kind of in your mind, rate each one on a scale of 1 to 10. Come up with a topic sentence that describes your assessment. So Stance Murray Monroe, 2013, did an excellent job of creating the variables in their study. Maybe that's your claim, right? Now you're going to back up that claim with the evidence from the study, description of the variables, showing how great of a job they did. They were less, a less effective at maintaining the internal validity of their study. And then explain why. Their statistical validity was, was quite good then back it up with some evidence. Now you can't use every piece of evidence. And not all evidence is going to be relevant to your claim. So you have to pick. And remember, you've got about a third of a page, maybe a little bit more, to make your case for each type of validity. Because once you've got all those together, then you've got to have an introduction where you tell me a little bit about the study. And that introduction has to include a thesis statement that gives me an overall assessment of the study in terms of validity. Then you also have to have a conclusion statement that pulls the study, that pulls the essay together. So your paper needs a clear introduction, body, and conclusion. You need to have a clear thesis statement. Every paragraph has to start with a clear topic sentence. Every paragraph has to focus on whatever that topic sentence is about. And you've got two pages. Double spaced, 12 point font, one inch margins. So build from the middle, build the middle first so you have some idea of what it is you want to talk about, what you want your thesis to be, then 
craft your thesis to fit the evidence you picked. Does that make sense? So our intro is going to be like kind of like an article summary, but very. It's going to be very brief because you're also going to be able to introduce some facts about the study in your discussion of validity. So you don't tell me everything I need to know about the study up front and then just talk about validity. You can give me a kind of very simple one or two sentence overview of the study and then introduce more detailed points as they are relevant in your discussion of validity. Does that work? Any questions? You've already got a one page summary, so you've already got a place to start, right? You can use parts of your own summary. If you want to modify that summary and use parts of it, you can. But I would actually recommend just start over in your head. You've written the summary, you know the details about this paper. Write it as if it were a new thing. Okay. All right. Go you.